University of Southern Mississippi, an anti-child porn organization, now incorporated. Um, at this point, I'll probably have to say that University of Southern Mississippi has the greatest IT department and computer science program. I have to say that now. Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me? All righty. Um, again, my name is Tim Lawless um, with the University of Southern Mississippi and um, anti-child porn organization. Um, I'm here to talk about um, a little project I've been working on. Um, St. Jude, St. Jude um, where we're trying to um, detect uh, improper retransitions. Um, uh, come on. Wake up. There we go. Of course, the computer thinks it's a Monday, too. Actually, no. Star Office. Um, Really, really happy with this person. Uh, this is my email address, and we'll be dropping uh, this uh, presentation plus other information out on this URL uh, a little bit later on today. Um, and St. Jude really came about because um, in our institution, we have to allow clear text passwords on a lot of systems, which, as you know, is, is the most evil thing that, that one can do. Um, and once you get in, they pretty much, it's just a matter of time. So we started looking for a way to save ourselves a lot of time from sleeping on the floor. Um, one thing led to another. Um, a guy put forth an idea back in October, I believe, of 97 in uh, System in Magazine about actually trying to detect the transitions into the uh, root user uh, by monitoring audit trails under Solaris. Um, that's really where we, where we got the beginning of this uh, and has come forward. The reason why we had to go and start looking at things like this is because our firewalls really would not protect us. We also with clear text passwords coming in. Um, our users themselves will expose our systems. Uh, they're, they're, they're sometimes our best friends and our worst enemies. As they would, um, the misuse detection uh, scanners like uh, Snort and, and the like uh, really would not pick up everything. Uh, we've already seen how they can be bypassed. Uh, how the uh, systems that we're putting out on our on our host really themselves can be defeated, and you will see this continually through the day. Um, and of course, we've come to love our Unix vendors, the, the ones who give us new root exploits in every update that they send out. Um, and we also, the problem also with our with our detection is that you may go one two days without finding it. Uh, unfortunately, system bins uh, will go on vacation. And the longer that that is, the more damage will be done to the system. But any time that they're on the system, we can't trust anything really on the system itself. Um, so that's where we began. When we began the project, we wanted to produce ultimately kernel level IDS implementation. Um, our target was Solaris, but we went over to Linux uh, because it was easier to do development. There was a little bit more information just to get, get, the, to get the wheels going. I can't. Um, we also wanted to try to minimize the number of false positives that we would be getting, uh, and of course, the negatives. Uh, that was a problem with uh, the original implementation put forth in SysAdmin is heap load of false negatives. Um, before we were, would be able to really respond to anything, we, we want to reduce those uh, false negatives and false positives uh, to a point where we won't shoot our users, plus we'll be able to catch enough of what's really going on. So what we were doing, we used the reference monitor implementation. I believe you'll probably hear a little bit more about this later on this evening. Um, when we talk, when uh, gentleman talks about uh, penetrating uh, B1 systems, um, we also went to uh, a rule-based anomaly detection. Um, in just a moment, I'll go in a little bit more about that and uh, model behavior for execution uh, after uh, reviewing um, copious uh, BSM outputs. 
know, before we get into this, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of we're going to talk about um, subjects and objects. Uh, how many here have, have dealt with uh, maybe trusted operating systems? Yes, no? Good. Excellent. So you'll, you'll follow what I'm saying. The subjects are, are the things that do things onto other things. Well, the objects are those which ha are being done on two. A little bit better definition is uh, put up there. Um, we'll also sometimes see that our subjects will be the objects themselves. Um, the reference monitor is, it will be enforcing our um, policy by forcing all actions performed uh, by the subject to actually um, go through it. It will act sort of as a stopgap to prevent things from occurring which we really do not want to occur. Um, the uh, rule-based anomaly IDS as opposed to our statistical uh, anomaly IDS systems. Um, given, given a rule set, if looking at a chain of events, We'll start off with the beginning where we'll enter the rule set and we'll move forward. If at some point one of the options at that point is not actually what is occurring, we have an anomaly going on. That's really uh, what, this, what this guy's about. It was implemented um, at LLL now and the um, Wisdom and Sense and also the Tim's project uh, with Digital Corporation. Um, let's see. And what we're going to be doing is uh, looking at, we take every subject uh, or process in our case, um, we would classify it as being a privileged or unprivileged process. Um, the privileges will be root, but it also may be a, a, a set of root plus somebody else. Uh, this would allow us to detect uh, transitions into, say, Oracle users or other uh, daemons that we're running within the system. Um, unprivileged subjects, just normal user processes, um, will transition up, like we know, through, through execution of set UID binaries. Um, in doing so, we, we then have to catch them and determine how they're beginning, where they're beginning, and the, the chain of events that may then occur. Um, the uh, privileged subjects processes will drop their privileges through one of, uh, in Linux, one of uh, these three calls. I believe under Solaris we'll, we'll be dealing with a uh, fourth one. Um, given the subject with privilege, um, and this is really where the decision is made, they may execute any other uh, file in the system to exceed only if the subject first drops its privileges through one of the means we just uh, talked about before and the um, object is within the uh, subject or the object is within the uh, restriction list uh, within the um, rule base. A subject without privilege may execute any object. Um, just a normal user may go about his daily life. As long as they do not transition up into a privileged state, we're going to be perfectly okay and allow them to do what they want. Now, upon execution, we're going to have to do some stuff and, and juggle around, uh, change our states, uh, where once upon execution, the new subject's uh, restriction list will be updated uh, based upon the subject's prior state and the objects executed. I'll show you in a moment where we, where we go through and um, have to say we're running a binary. Um, he calls another function, and he's okay to execute. We've already uh, passed it on. The binary will then um, find the best rule and we have to ensure that the, uh, the, the next rule for what the, net, what the next guy that's about to run can do is a subset of the um, current processes rule. Otherwise, we could gain privileges uh, just merely by executing a certain path of, of, of applications. Finally, a subject's updated restriction must be a subject of the subject's prior restriction list that we just went into. Uh, this is currently where we're standing right now. We've uh, got a Slurs Perl impl implementation. It'll run currently under Slurs 251 through 8. Uh, 8 has some problems with its arguments where it will not give those out to us in the uh, BSM. 
uh, it's not yet been fixed by uh, some microsystems. And the current Linux implementation is running um, at this time not on a multiprocessor system. Uh, we do not use um, ArcVs for context in the uh, Perl module at this point, but under Solaris, I mean under uh, the Linux kernel, we are using the arguments uh, to decide our context. The reason this being is uh, some applications will make a call to system, for example, uh, which goes out there and will run slash bin slash sh with the dash minus c, and then the argument passed to system as um, the third argv. I mean, uh, argv to the uh, third argument. Without being able to look at our argvs for, con for the context of what we want to do, uh, we would then just have to allow these programs that are executing uh, uh, a system call to then just go merrily out and uh, run in the shell, which is something bad. Um, we're hoping to have an internal Solaris implementation out by around Christmas of uh, this year, maybe early 2001 at worst. Um, probably in the uh, 2.7, uh, 7 point, Solaris 7 kernel, uh, 8.0 uh, at worst. And just to show you, um, I'll switch the slides, I'm sorry. Externally, internal versus external, inside or outside the kernel. When we implement, when we would do this, um, to be able to really stop the things before they occur, we would have to do it within the kernel uh, to preempt them. Um, however, when we go into the kernel, some things, some things change. Um, externally, when we get them out through our audit trails, the, each event is a discrete instance. Um, in one line, this one event, we have all the information about what's going on. While inside the kernel, we're watching it as it's actually going on. Uh, sometimes we have to wait until another event occurs before we can just really determine what happened with the prior event. For example, with the execution of a set UID binary, the uh, execution code down in the file system uh, uh, objects in the Linux kernel will actually set the um, UID and uh, the effective user ID to zero uh, during uh, the execution phase. However, since exec never returns, we never really know that a set UD binary has, has in fact been executed until another event occurs and we can really see, we can infer from what has changed in the, the state of the system that the, it was in fact a set UID binary that, that went forth and then we build our from there. Externally, uh, the detection is delayed. Uh, in the Solaris implementation, we're seeing about two, three seconds on a, uh, on a single processor system. A um, little bit less on a multiprocessor system, but at that point, we begin racing uh, to see who can, who can kill whom first. Also, externally, it is easy within those two seconds, two, three seconds, to, to strip a kill of the external, uh, the external monitor. Um, Within the kernel, it's a little bit harder. You would have to do it before actually doing an exec, which would require you to have the, the code within the, in the module itself. Uh, for example, uh, this little, little application uh, will we'll execute a bash shell. Uh, give us, so if it's set UID root, we give us root normally. Let me just put over here for a second. Let's see, thanks. Normally, we're running this. Um, we've dropped out to a root shell upon upon execution of the binary. Um, however, going through the the uh, Sinju model, the font. Yes, sir. Just a second, please. I'm sorry. Uh, let me s uh, find a nice. This is good with fine.
Yeah. It did get big. Well. Okay. Let's try this one again. Normally. Maybe we'd be dropped out to a rich show. Um, possibly. Uh, is there... this point, uh, your, your, your friendly administrator will spend the next uh, evening, uh, instead of with his wife and kids, rebuilding a system. Uh, what we want to do, what we want to do, I'm sorry, let me just, I'm going to go in here and load up the module. And then it catches the uh, exec just as it begins. Um, it kills it at the exec process end. We just drop, drop out a message to our K. Oops. Well, to our K log. Um, there are some. Uh, this would catch uh, the buffer overflows. We've tried it with uh, several buffer, with pretty much all the buffer overflows we could. I try not to keep many buffer overflow vulnerabilities on my laptop. Um, I apologize. I'm nervous. Um, duh, you can tell. Uh, let's see if I can just minimize this guy. Right now there's no no other tracing. Um, when we're playing into kernel, um, well we're not outputting any tracing. Um, there's some extra tracing in there depending on the, the compile time um, defines you do. But right now the minimal ones will just make your hard drive rattle for several hours uh, for just running an LS. Um, it is feasible to, to, to add in additional um, tracing into the system, uh, just modifying the, the source code of, of the main of the main app, main app, that C file. I'll get into the source code in just a minute. Let me find the window. And I want to. I'm going to have to fast forward through these again, probably. Unfortunately, some things in Unix are not quite as good as they are in Windows yet. Oh, pay attention too. I feel like I'm doing patches right now. Unfortunately, right now there is no silver bullet. Not even this guy can really stop everything. He would be just another layer in there. Um, for example, with the buffer overflow, the buffer overflow actually does occur. Um, the shell code does get executed. However, just at that execute is where it's caught and it's stopped. That's why I'm referring to this what we refer to as, as the last ditch effort right before Hellfire and Brimstone falls down upon us. Um, also, the restriction rules must be written. Uh, there's some applications, for example, I discovered when I came here, I have been spoiled all my life and uh, have not used PPP yet, that the uh, Usernet CTL script uh, causes uh, that module to go really wild. Uh, so you have to go through and write out the rules in the, uh, in the uh, script uh, before it will um, before it will not catch those in action or let them pass. Um, also, there's the additional overhead. As we're playing around within the kernel, um, 
just doing the extra stuff and munging the data, it costs a little bit. Uh, just executing user processes without going through um, having to do any of the checks. We're seeing less than 1% slowdown. However, let's say we're root and we're compiling a kernel. Um, see almost a 5% slowdown at that point, and it's really spending it in system time now because we're having to update all of our um, checklists. There's really no optimizations in at this time. Um, we do have some inline functions, but that's it. Now, the rule sets that I spoke of, that's the end of the slide presentation, I'm sorry. Um, no network connection right now. Sorry. Oh yeah. Well, let me just hit that right here. Well, unfortunately, it's not PowerPoint, but religious reasons prevent me from using that. Um, that's the contact information once again. Uh, probably by one or two o'clock this afternoon, we'll probably have uh, this PowerPoint out there. Uh, along with the source code. Uh, the source code is available on PacketStorm at this time. Uh, sent out an update last night. Um, got it? Good? Okay. Okay. Now, that will... Let's try to get this a little bit smaller. Much better. Let's. Can you hear me? Good. Whoa. For example, right down here are the general rules that we've. Um, the real sites, and then unfortunately we're having to compile them in by hand right now, not read them at load time. Um, we do want to be able to go to root sometimes, uh, and so we're going to have some guys that really have to be granted a pardon. Uh, SU and sudo, uh, by the way, sudo is bad, you should never use it, um, are in there. Uh, uh, Gene Mixer uh, was one that just had to go in there because it will execute mod probe uh, through system um, as root. Uh, otherwise, sound gets really loud and you can't, or you can't turn it off. Are there any questions? Yes. Pardon. No, as long a set UID process may execute. However, it may not execute other processes by default. The default rule down here is actually rule zero, which is none. You can really go through and execute nothing else. Um, but that set UID process itself may execute. Uh, by granting all privileges, it may it has carte blanche in your system. SU and sudo, of course, would be application where we'd want to do that. Uh, I don't think there would be anything else we'd want to do that for. Um, uh, some of the testing that we did, just with, with a couple things, uh, it gets really long, unfortunately. That's the nature of the beast right now for this guy. Um, we're wanting to add in later support for just loading it in from a configuration file. Yes, right now I can. Uh, there is the um, option in there commented out uh, for debugging purposes uh, to uh, prevent the, the loading of the unloading uh, options. We just replaced the, um, uh, the load and the, cl and the clear module uh, op uh, uh, syscalls uh, in there. Now it is still possible to attack it through uh, KMEM, however, uh, Personally, using lids to prevent that, and maybe something put in uh, this guy later on in the future. Uh, 
policy such as what we're looking at, what we were just looking at. Initially, what we'd wanted, what we'd have to go do is go through a learning phase where we just run through the system normally in a, in a safe environment, not plugged into the network. We just hope we know what we're going to run on the system beforehand. After determining uh, from the output of the learning process, which is does everything but still permits it to actually execute, it just gives us the error message. And from those, we then write, would be able to write these rules. Um, once that these rules are populated, you've recompiled without the learning option enabled. You'd load that in and, and go from there. Uh, when you make changes to the system, which may require these root execute features, um, you'd have to modify and and, go, and reload from there. Not, not, through, not through this guy. Uh, he's really, what he, he wraps himself around the kernel at, the, at this point. And f in fact, now let me just go into. Um Since also, since we can't link when we build a module to make it manageable, we've, in, we've done includes. My C professor, shit, when he saw this. I, I think I committed a sin. Um, and loading the module, um, this is just handling the execs since um, I point you to the, the, the stuff by Pragmatic of THC for how to handle execs. Um, but going down here, what we do is we we're saving the original syscall to a pointer, replacing it with our wrapper, and within that wrapper, we're going to make a call to that original syscall. Um, so we just wrap ourselves around the kernel. We're not actually in being invasive, and that's why we can actually pull ourselves out without much problem. That would be possible. Uh, it would not be part of the module itself because it's su it such it would be such an expensive process to do. Probably through a uh, pro uh, slash proc uh, file system interface with a monitoring daemon running that you would then be able to do that. I'm sorry. It was asked uh, whether we would be able to um, at some later point modify this so that it would uh, communicate or and be able to attack the offend, offending processes, offending users' um, processes, and pretty much retaliate against the login instance uh, that, that may be perpetrating this. Would I be correct in saying that? Basically, be able to take the information for process ID and then do further gathering of what process is running, uh, dump of what the actual memory is. Dump of memory and just... just Whatever you want to take from uh, that would be something we'd be doing in an external monitoring application, the um, dumping of memory and gathering of, of further information about the offending processes. Yeah, dur during the execs, uh, forks, um, and to a much lesser extent, the uh, set UIDs and exits. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I could I could see see how it, it would be much easier to do it in user space uh, versus kernel space since a lot of the fun with with viewing it in kernel space is you've got this you're set right here and you're limited in your what you can do. A lot of just string calls you're going to have to write them yourself since you do, cannot call external libraries while in kernel space. Uh, plus. If you core dump in kernel space, that's a bad thing. <laughs> yes. Um, we lost exec many times. Everything keeps running. Nothing else will. Um, what was that? But after we load the, uh, the functions and wrap ourselves, it just goes on. Uh, 
right now we're al allowed to clean up our module, we free our memory of, and, and go on. What normally we do uh, to prevent you from cleaning up, prevent you from cleaning up or loading in other modules, uh, is we just replace those with an error message of either uh, for loading no memory or uh, for clean up module, module not found. Uh, and it just errors out and blocks any attempts to add or remove. Uh, because those syscalls can be called from uh, within, uh, for example, a buffer overflow. Uh. Apache runs as nobody, so really you'd be hitting just running in user space at that point. Um, hmm? Yeah. Uh, if you're if you're just in user, if you're just uh, without without privileges, not root, uh, we branch out just into the wrap, wrapper and go straight to the syscall itself. So that it's practically no expense if you're just doing user stuff. Um, Named D. Let's say you're not running uh, named D as um, as root. Uh, just a moment uh, on that. But let's say you're running named D on, on, as root, uh, and that guy was and that guy was cracked. Uh, you had no. He could not really execute anything else after that. Maybe named D expert would be the only thing he would be allowed to run. It would catch that. Um, with one caveat, we still have a lot of stuff that starts up at the beginning. We're still generating rules for that, and we're working on handling login because login will sometimes transition over be logged in root on console or login user. We're playing playing with how we would handle that guy right now. Uh, that'd be one thing that come out within the next two three versions. Um, the question, uh, sorry, the question was. Um, what would be the load with like running this running this with an Apache web server? Um, other web servers, I have run this with rocks and without any problems. Um, just running regular CGIs. Unless I shoot myself in the foot by making an error in my my, my logic. Um, but yeah. Um, we can go with with we can go with all with a, a set of privileges, which root will always be the super will be the, the superset. Um, easier for just development right now. It's been it's been root uh, because that's been the parts where where my headache personally came from, which caused me to really want to do this. Uh, I don't like sleeping on machine room floors. I asked why do why are we just limiting this to uh, to to root transitions? Um, also transitioning just from user to user until you transition into until into that root user, you can have your other IDS utilities running out there as root with more privilege than that than that user monitoring them. T2I Snoop, uh, other applications, watching logs. Uh, but once they actually acquire that root privilege and they're in the system, you can no longer trust that stuff. So the only thing that has more privilege than root is kernel. Anything? Pardon? Uh, issue well right now because the root. Uh, the question is, if you're using SU, is there uh, anything to help? I'm not quite sure if I fully understand what you're. Unfortunately, right now SU is a trust is. You know, if it's a trusted binary uh, to keep it more secure. If if SU is, if you if you can root SU. Especially on the Linux box, congratulations, man. Don't let anyone find out about it. Uh, <laughs> you could own the world, literally. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, sudo, I do it for convenience. Um, but really, issue would be the only one you really should have in there. On um, hopes, issue secure. I hope people have been hacking on it, trying to get it not to be secure enough. Yes, sir. Back in the back. Your trusted binary table is running. I know that the program for it. 
I'm, ch I'm storing the argument itself, not the inode. Uh, so moving around files on the file system would not affect it. Uh, and it's a little bit, and I, th I think you, you were probably going towards the LIDS project in, in that questioning. Uh, we're really not doing ACLs at, at any, any point in here. Uh, if flesh bin is an issue, could be replaced, yes. Uh, however, with proper, I hope the file, system, if the file system is set up properly, it should not be easily replaced without already having the privilege which you're trying to acquire. Um, and then again, if they have physical access to your machine, you might as well just pack it up and go home. Pardon, sir? Copy a set UID binary. No, because we're actually looking at the, at the file name as it's coming in uh, through the exec, which is the fully qualified path name, not the, not the uh, arg via zero. Uh, the guy, uh, we were asking if, uh, for example, you created a, uh, sli uh, bin, a user bin under your home directory and would run SU under that, would, it, would that be it? Uh, which I think you were trying to get at if we were checking slash arg via zero, you'd have relative path issues. Uh, ch root. Um, actually, I don't know. I'd have to try that back in the hotel room. That would be correct. You would not be able to give it set UID root privileges. Yeah. You'd have to have a collaborating administrator. <laughs> or a negligent one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, pretty much within a group, but just just the guys have been um, beating on it. A few other people would like to see what people could do to it. Yes, yes, sir. Right in the back. Um, the question was if uh, NARC was loaded prior to this module actually being loaded onto the system, would it be able to detect the root transitions? Um, if you tried to execute something, like let's say an LS or just, just a command through the system, it would catch that. Um, if just any Trojan binary that you that just say anything, just not not even that guy. Um, if he did not have to call exec up to that point, you would not it would not be it would not go through the um, the reference monitor to to uh, be stopped or permitted through. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right now. Um, well, uh, the question is why? Why has uh, symmetrical multiprocessor boxes been excluded at this point? At this point, we are not handling spin locks within the code, so race conditions probably would occur. Um, that is something else to, to be going into. First, need to get a good SMP box <laughs> that I can crash. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, could you could you repeat that a little bit louder? We're not using. Um, let me just go into that, and I'll, I'll show you. Um, where is that? His question: If you modified argv of zero to point to a legitimate file, would it be uh, able to to um, to, to bypass it. Uh, and no, that was one that actually came up earlier on um, in the testing. What is it? Try S calls. Yeah. 
Um, we're not using the, the, the file name that actually comes in through the exact same, which is really what is executed. We, that's what we're using for it to figure what you're going to run out. Run, yeah. Yes, sir. The, the, well, if, if, it, if it is a buffer overflow. That is, that is. This guy, sorry. Is there a Sean Hedges in this room? Sean Hedges? Okay. Um, sorry. Um, could you could you repeat for me? Sure. Let's let's use an memory that's been overwritten is not in kernel space. It's on it's, the memory that's overwritten is on the stack at that point in time. You're not you're not in the kernel memory at that point. You're still actually in user in user space. Um, we're, we're trying to terminate. We try to terminate the process at that point. Call, exit the process. So we're literally just destroying the, the offending application because after that buffer overflow and we deny the exec. Um, it's not deterministic what, what will happen. The, the shell code will execute if we're on a buffer overflow. It stops it at the exec itself. You call the syscalls. Yes, uh, in normal production, you would not have have the unloading of the module. We would be overriding, actually replacing the syscalls for loading and unloading the module, or you would have to go through an attack KMEM at that point. Which, yes, sir. To run the actual shell, not 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 the exact calls. The question is if you could actually just write a shell in the buffer. That was actually not the attack that we are, that we have uh, recently been actually looking at, uh, such as not so much writing a shell, but writing what you want to occur within the attack within it. Through say, for, just to give you an example, uh, one that we're trying to work on now is um, handling. You call open, uh, open etc password in write mode, write out a new line, close the file. Probably even take up less space than what you're probably shooting at. Uh, at which point, that's where you'd bring in other applications, not a silver bullet, uh, things like lids, where you actually be watching and protecting these files. Yes, sir. That would be something that we would be doing actually in an external application. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, pardon? You could write a shell code for one of those and rename TMP slash whatever. Actually, you would have to co you would copy the binary over. Yes. Yes, but that's you would be wanting to. Uh, You'd be using applications like LIDs where you would be protecting the files themselves, your root file systems, yes. And with, uh, it is 1046, so if there are any other questions. 
I thank you for coming. Um,